Good evening, everyone. Good evening from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and good evening from Manama, Bahrain. This is Nawal Al Hamwi. Firstly, I want to thank uh, our sponsors, StreamYard, for sponsoring our event. We couldn't have done it without their help. So thank you, StreamYard, once again, for helping the community. I want to thank uh, Khulud Al Banna and Munib Yunus for, uh, because they will be moderating the chats. So uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, throw your questions in the uh, uh, chat area. So uh, today we will be talking, talking about how do uh, the engines of the games uh, work under the hood. So we have uh, Amin al Tajir from GDG Manama. Amin is the CEO of uh, in, uh, Infinite Wear. It's an artificial intelligence company that provides products and services to several clients across the globe. Uh, Inf Infinite Wear has been working with large clients such as Saudi Aramco, STC, and the government of Bahrain. Amin has been in the software business for more than 15 years. And uh, you can find uh, Amin al Tajir on social media. I will, uh, we will uh, write out the uh, his uh, so social media handle. So, I mean, the show is all yours. All but the luck. Thank you, Noel. Thank you guys very much for having me in here. Such a pleasure to work with GDG Jeddah. Never done it before, but this is the first time, and I'm super and probably extra, you know, hyped for this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much again. Uh, we normally do do these sort of sessions for you know the game development community. However, we wanted to do this here uh, for GDG Jeddah. Uh, you know, for a change. And yeah, super excited. So let's go ahead. OK, so the name of my talk is uh, Understanding Game Engines, or how do game engines work from the inside? Um, let's go for it. So a bit of uh, you know, a brief, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Amina Tajir. You can always access my content at aminatajir.com, uh, or you can always find me on social media uh, at, at Amina Tajir. Uh, so I used to work for Saudi Aramco for a very long time. Uh, and the funny thing is I got uh, access to Saudi Aramco given my game development background, which was you know, the portfolio that I used to have online back on my uh, game development website, which was called ps3code.com. As you can probably tell, very influenced by the PS3 tech. And uh, currently I have my blog at amin.ai. And you can also find our work at infiniteware at infoware.com, where we have a lot of work, you know, relevant to the space of AI. Uh, some of the clients that we have, or Saudi Aramco by far, is the biggest, and we have STC, UGB, Zane, and a couple of more. So we've been around for almost 10 years now. So there you got it. Okay, so at Infiniteware, we actually, because we are an AI business, we uh, live by three values. The first one is we automate mundane and repetitive work. Second is we promise more intellectual bandwidth. And the third is we use real intelligence to make value. However, these are you know the things that you know make Infiniteware what it is. Okay, now for this talk today, we're going to have an agenda that is split into probably three or four parts, depending how you want to see it. The first one is we're going to have a tour on uh, basically the common game engines, the popular ones out there, and we're going to have uh, a look at what happens uh, in terms of their duties, how they work, and then the second we finish that sort of generic tour, we're going to get into that detailed components sort of. Uh, look under the hood where we see the exact components that make up every single engine that you see out there. Um, at the very end, we're going to have a bit of hands-on, so we're not going to be programming game engine code or so, but however, I'm just going to open one of the game engines that I really like. Um, the source code is based on C++, so it might be low level. However, I'm going to take you by the hand to understand how it works. And so you can see things in action uh, and you know understand how the whole engine really you know uh, plays a huge part when it comes to making uh, uh, the game what it is. And last but not least, we can always finish with the QA, and that's pretty much it. Okay, enough with the paperwork, let's go for it. So you probably have heard uh, of the game engines out there. There are quite some, uh, you know, some popular ones uh, out there. We have Unity, you have Unreal Engine 4, and now we're getting into Unreal Engine 5 also. You probably heard about Game Maker, which is a very popular game engine for 2D games. CryEngine, if you're a big fan of the uh, <laughs> the Crisis game. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. And you, as a game developer, you get to be very picky. I mean, what should I use exactly for my game? Which is the million dollar question if you're coming into this game development uh, scene. But yeah, the idea is there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of choices. And as a game developer, you have to really be super picky and selective. 
when it comes to choosing the one that works well with your uh, with your game. And we're going to get into that and the specifics of how you can choose and why would you choose uh, one of the uh, basically the game engines out there. Okay, so the ones that we just showed now were the public ones, or let's say the commercial ones out there, like Unity, uh, the Unity engine. Uh, Unreal Engine now is becoming a very uh, popular one. It, it was not that case before, given it was a private game engine and it was licensed in a very difficult terms, honestly. But now we still have uh, internal game engines that are not very popular uh, to the public, given that they are dealt with extreme secrecy or let's say confidentiality for different reasons, be it legal or be it IP specific reasons or so. So you have uh, the Fox engine, which is pretty popular if you're coming from the Metal Gear Solid era, you know, where a lot of people still remember the, you know, the favorite game, uh, Metal Gear Solid. You also have the Red Engine, which is the same engine that they, these guys used for, um, if I'm not mistaken, The Witcher, The Witcher game. Decima is uh, one of my favorite engines uh, being used in Horizon Zero Dawn. And I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, it's still being used in Death Stranding. You can probably check that out online to double check. And my ultimate favorite, which is uh, the Naughty Dog engine by Naughty Dog themselves. The same engine that we used uh, with Uncharted, the game series, and with The Last of Us 1 and 2. So there you have it. So we have two kind of game engines out there. We have the public ones that we saw in the beginning, uh, things like the Unity engine, or I'm sorry, not this one, the Unity engine, the Unreal engine, the Game Maker, uh, and CryEngine, and so. So all of these guys that you can see here can be bought online, or you can just probably just license them. Uh, However, for these guys in here, you have to be affiliated with those developers in order to get those. It's a private source code base, so not everyone can have hands-on on, uh, on those engines. And there are specific reasons for those. Okay, so a lot of people ask themselves, okay, why are you so excited about game engines? What is so special about that? Well, the million-dollar question is, you know, what is so special about those can be answered with those specific, you know, answers that I have in here. The first one is, a game engine really decides how your game is going to be played out uh, in terms of performance, in terms of even features. So everything that you have in terms of vision for your game, in terms of uh, game mechanics, uh, the physics aspects of your game, can all all of these guys uh, really are dependent on the features of the game engine that you're using for your game. So uh, a good example is Game Maker, for example. So Game Maker is a 2D game engine. You will, it's going to be probably very difficult for you to put 3D uh, game art within the game engine. You have to do a lot of tweaks, but eventually you're not going to get a 3D game engine. You're not going to you're not going to get a 3D uh, scenery within the game engine. And so, and that is a very simple case. There are game engines out there that are specific to first-person shooters, FPS games, as you probably know. And uh, there are a uh, couple of game engines out there that really excel when we're doing platformers, you know, uh, regular games where you have to jump through platforms in order to proceed in the game. So what I'm trying to say here, there's a lot of specifics and nuances in understanding how game engines work, because eventually for a game developer, a game engine will really just, you know, scope, uh, you know, your, let's say the perimeter or the boundary of your ideas, your game design ideas. Okay, so before we chart into the exact components and the specifics of the game engine, let me show you exactly where game engines differ. The first one is eye candy, which is probably the most, uh, let's say, uh, attractive thing about games nowadays. So a lot of people just, you know, by, by the, the mirror watch of flicking uh, at the screen, you can really tell that, hey, this looks like a, game, a nice game because of the eye candy. And so... A good example is Horizon Zero Dawn, which is a very popular game that was released for the PS4. If you know we have so many fanboys in here, <laughs> I'm one of you guys, so don't get very scared. Um, so yeah, Horizon Zero Dawn, as you can probably tell, has a very cool scenery. There's a lot of details in there, things like lighting, shadows, um, even the exact details of the art that you see here on screen. All of these things are dependent on the specifics of the game engine and the features of the game engines. Uh, that we have out there. Um, so yeah, everything that you see from art to animation, it's all handled within the game engine. So it's pretty much it's pretty much 
dependent on the features of the engine. A lot of game engines out there really excel when it comes to do 2D art. However, they can't, uh, you know, support 3D stuff. And so, and there are certain game engines that really excel when it comes to doing, let's say, AI, but they it, they don't have the, let's say, the other elements, let's say uh, something like sound or even, uh, you know, graphics. But in this case, graphics is a pretty big deal when choosing an engine, the fidelity of the art that you have on the screen really, the, the, you know, really the, gets you to decide really well on the sort of game engine that you want on board. So a couple of images in here to show the fidelity that is driven by some of the engines out there. So Horizon Zero Dawn, this game that I showed, just show you here, uh, utilizes the Decima engine, the one uh, done by Guerrilla Games, which is a very popular game uh, studio. And then you guys have, uh, you have here The Last of Us, a lot of talks on The Last of Us 2. We're not going to get into that. There's a lot of back and forth. However, nobody can deny how amazing the technicality behind The Last of Us, the graphics, the AI, and all of these things. But yeah, there you have it. The details on the hair, the details on the beard itself, uh, the skin itself, how it reacts to the uh, to the light out there. So yeah, there's a lot of details you know, that make up the graphics behind the game. And game engines are in the front of these things. And most of the game engines out there really you know, give give a lot of focus, maybe more than 40% of their workload on the game engines, uh, on the graphics aspect uh, aspects, because it drives a lot of, let's say, attractive, uh, a lot of users just basically come to the engine just by the mere show of the you know, graphics fidelity. So no denying in that. Uncharted for the people who love the PS, uh, who love the, you know, the the sort of IP on the PlayStation. Again, it is the work of Naughty Dog, and nobody can deny how Naughty Dog is really, really good when it comes to crafting such detailed, you know, work. Just look at the skin in here. You know how the beard is showing up. Uh, how the like how his chest really responds to light and the details on the hand and the face and the, yeah, just amazing. There's a lot of details. If you're an artist. You're probably freaking out right now <laughs> more than I do, <laughs> more than I am here. Okay, so the first thing that we talked about, as we said, is the graphics fidelity. The second thing that really uh, that that really makes it important for you to, to choose uh, a game en a game engine for your game is the capability to go and support massive worlds. Now, this is a very huge deal if you're talking about open world games, things like Metal Gear Solid Five. Uh, I know a lot of people have their own thoughts on the, <laughs> the game design and such. However, you know, a game like Metal Gear Solid Five, Horizon Zero Dawn, and God of War now Four, you know, has uh, these games have a lot of details that have to be shown in the game itself as you roam around in the world. So supporting massive worlds is really, really important nowadays. It's no longer, you know, it's no longer a uh, luxury to be supported. It is actually a must for modern games, and so. When we're talking about massive uh, massive worlds, you have a screenshot here from uh, Naughty Dog again within the game of Uncharted 4 that was released for the PS4. And one of the things that people don't really acknowledge and don't understand in here, and that is, you know, the scenery here in the back is actually a, 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 a live scenery, meaning if you come down here from the tower and you actually walk in there, you can probably, you know, interact with the objects in there. It's not just a background image. And this is the most important thing to be acknowledged in here. All of these details that you see currently on the screen, they're all live and you can, as a player, go and interact with them. So it's amazing how a game engine, of course, supported by the hardware, can do that sort of experience where you can just interact with every single thing on the screen. So there you have it. The Rise of Tomb Raider, uh, Tomb Raider also a good game by Crystal Dynamics, big fan of the studio. And again, everything that you see in here on the screen is not just an image, it's actually interactable uh, objects. So you can go ahead and you know uh, touch them and probably interact with them. So that is the second thing. Now we're going to this third thing here and the uh, probably one of the most favorite elements uh, of all time is the idea of physics. And so eventually in your game, we're gonna have a lot of objects, right? And it's not just placing those objects. You also wanna have those objects to interact with each other in the most, let's say, believable way possible. And so in order to do that, the game engine itself has a very specific component that tries to replicate, or let's say that tries to uh, get the engine to behave as uh, real as possible in terms of physics. And so most game engines either implement that uh, in-house, meaning they actually write the exact code 
that uses uh, Newton rules uh, in order to implement uh, the physics in the game. And some of the studios out there really delegated to other people. So they licensed some of the physics engine, uh, physics engines out there and they you know, integrated part of the engine. And a lot of game engines do that. And so a good example is Unreal Engine. So Unreal Engine 4, even though it's a very huge engine, there's a lot of stuff happening in the engine itself. They figured out that, you know what? We're not gonna focus on physics. Physics is a very tough area that has already been done uh, better than us. And if you actually go into the, through the source code, you will see that Unreal Engine really uh, relies on physics, which is the name of the engine by, uh, if I'm not mistaken, NVIDIA. However, uh, if the uh, platform really supports it. But yeah, I just wanted to tell you guys that even the physics in your game has to be implemented somewhere. Somebody has to go and act, put the actual code that simulates the real physics, uh, the real laws of physics within the game, which gives you know the game a bit of more uh, dimension uh, when it comes to realism. Uh, a good example also is Mad Max by Avalanche Studios, a wonderful game. Uh, the way it reacts to the physics of the game, collision, things blowing up, all of that is actually game logic. You know uh, that that supports you know the physics of uh, the that uses the support of the physics engine uh, basically under the hood. So there's a lot to it. Number four, we have world creation. So so far, what we've seen is the basic elements that we normally see when we play a game. We normally witness how you know amazing the graphics are, how uh, the massive the world is. Um, how the physics reacts, you know, within the game itself. However, there are elements that are also important to the game, the engine, but not a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, attention uh, is happening on that side as gamers. You know, as gamers, most gamers wouldn't know that there's also a missing piece that happens under the hood that only game developers deal with, and that is world creation. So if you're trying to develop a game, there is this sort of uh, world editor that, you know, each each game engine has their own you know naming scheme for that, but basically it's a world editor, meaning it's sort of screen where you place objects and you you move them around, you create the 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 world as you like, and then you just give it to the game engine. The game engine you know puts everything within the game and manages all of these resources. So I'll just show you here a couple of examples here. So this is Unreal Engine Four for the people who are big fan uh, big fans of the Unreal Engine Four. I'll just show you a couple of things in here. For example, you've got the elements here that you can place in the scene. Uh, you can put, for example, lights if you want to. If you want, you can put cubes. You can also check out the elements here in the content uh, browser where you can put uh, 3D graphics, static meshes, static meshes, um, animations, uh, a lot of stuff that you can basically put in here. Buildings if you want. And this is where the where this is the exact area where you go and manage. The elements within the world. You can move stuff. You can check out how the lighting is operating in here. Also, we have something that we call the scene graph, which essentially is a full list of every single element that you have in your game. And so a game developer is going to have a very close look to the list in here to double check that they're not going over their budget in terms of performance. That they and the uh, and the key uh, element here here is the more you have stuff on screen, the more you know the slower your game is going to be. And so you have to be very careful when it comes to putting elements on the screen. Be very conservative uh, when it comes to, you know, to putting those stuff, just to make sure that you strike this sort of balance of beauty versus performance. And so at the very end here, we have the property screen or the details, you know, if you're going with the Unreal Engine's terminology, where you can exactly change the specifics of each element that you put here in the world editor. Things like, um, let's say, uh, the color of the land, uh, the light color, uh, the size of, let's say, this co the, the perimeter of the light that you're putting in there, the direction of the sunlight, all of these things can be modified within this property screen. So as you can probably see, there's a lot to it. And that is not only that, by the way. There's in Unreal Engine, it's, uh, it's an ocean of <laughs> crazy material. So it is, in my honest opinion, it's a very steep curve to master Unreal Engine. There's a lot to it. You've got animations, you got stuff uh, that have to do with physics, sound, uh, artificial intelligence. So this is just a very small glimpse of what you can get when you operate with Unreal Engine. And this is the very popular Unity engine uh, that allows a lot of people to develop games, uh, games for mobile, uh, for web browsers, 
and also for consoles, in case you did not know. So it's exactly the same principle where you can place things in that virtual world. However, the screen is different. You've got the scene graph in here where you can see all of these elements, and we have this sort of relationship of parent and child where you can put things in. As you move the parent, the son, or in this case, the child is going to move in relative uh, in relation to uh, you know the parent in the scene graph. You also have all of these resources in here, or uh, the the actual content where you can drag and drop into the scene. And last but not least, in the inspector screen, you can go and change those elements. So all of these are you know fancy state of the art stuff for each game engine. And even while choosing a game engine, you want to make sure that you are very comfortable with the with the front end and how to exactly use it. And also, there is one element that does not necessarily have uh, a UI for it, which is the pipeline. Now, when you have a game engine, you normally deal with multiple, uh, let's see, various uh, formats of um, files and media. For example, if you're developing a 3D game, you have 3D assets, you have static meshes, you have also animations, you have skeletons, you have bones, you, you, know, you got a lot of stuff, you've got materials. And all of these things can be developed by different tool sets, different programs. A good example is when you deal with Blender. So Blender is a very popular 3D package that allows you to do uh, static meshes, uh, basically 3D art, and it allows you to do um, even animations if you want. And so working with Blender, so if you have an artist working with Blender, you want to make sure that the pipeline is very smooth for them uh, when they're developing their content and you know, in the way you want it transmitted and put it in the uh, game engine eventually, because the game engine eventually is where everything just you know uh, gets done, and you know before you basically build the game. But however, those elements, things like uh, creating the music, creating the art, creating the sound, this, all of these you know various stuff happening out there have to eventually be in the game engine. And so you want to make sure that the pipeline or the facility, that technical facility that allows you to take the content from those tools into the game engines uh, and the, into the game engine that you have at your hand is really suitable and very efficient. And an underline under you know that word efficient because you can have a very cool tool, let's say a very cool package that allows you to do a 3D content. However, it might be super difficult for you, you know, uh, to move the content from that tool into your game engine. So it's going to be a hassle. It's going to be a nightmare for the game developer working on the game to eventually get those content uh, content files. And so, yeah, the game engines out there are working all the time to support those state-of-the-art tools, things like Blender, 3ds Max, Maya, um, even tools for audio, for example, uh, Audacity, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so all of these tools out there have their own sort of support within you know state-of-the-art game engines out there. And notably, Unreal Engine. So Unreal Engine and Unity represent the majority of the market share for commercial game engines. And uh, they're doing a great job supporting most of, most, uh, most of the stuff out there. In one way, you know, in order to achieve that is making sure that we are using standards. So a good example is when you're dealing with Blender or let's say 3ds Max, you don't want to operate with this with a specific format that comes with, with that specific package. So if you're developing, let's say, content with Maya or 3ds Max, you're not going to ask your 3D animator or 3D artist to export the files or the content in the format, which is proprietary to Maya or Blender in this case. You're going to ask them to, uh, for the most part, export it into what we call an FBX format, uh, which is the standard format for a lot of the 3D content out there. And that sort of file, which is, which has the extension of FBX, contains most of the time the details of the animation, you know, the bones, how they move. Uh, and uh, and some of the time, even uh, these files are going to have the material itself, you know, the colors, the skin tones, all of these things that come with the 3D mesh itself. So what I'm trying to say here, you know, 3D content, among a lot of stuff that game engines do, uh, do work with, are, are basically, uh, you know, it's very complicated in, in nature. It's very complicated formats, uh, you know, these things like 3D uh, animations and such. There are, they're basically layers of, you know, uh, content and stuff. 
And so when you want to import it into a game engine, you want to make sure that you have the right support to get all of these elements. Most of the time people suffer from, you know, importing the 3D stuff from Blender. However, when they come into the engine, you only get the 3D asset itself without the colors, without the skin tones, uh, without the, the material, without the depth, uh, the, the depth of the, uh, of the of the 3D assets. And so having a proper, you know, pipeline from those 3D packages, among other tools, into the game engine is an ultimate necessity. You can't go without that. And now choosing a game engine, you know, uh, is a pretty big deal. And a lot of focus is actually happening on the pipeline itself. So just be aware of that when you choose game engine. All right, for number six, cross-platform, which is the holy grail for game developers. Now, if you're developing a game, most of the time you want to support multiple uh, platforms out there, right? You don't want to just build your game and just you know, get it on Android and you're good to go. You also want to support iPhone, you know, iOS, basically, uh, PC, uh, other stuff. But ultimately, for most game developers, they also want to support consoles, game consoles, things like the PS3, PS4, and now the PS5, uh, the Xbox. All of these things are, you know, interesting for game developers to have their games on. However, it's very difficult to get your game on such platforms because each single platform uh, has their own setup, their own libraries, their own code base. So it becomes super difficult, you know, to allow programmers to program for all of these platforms, the specifics of these platforms. And so the way to go is you just develop your game using one of those engines, and then the engine itself is going to give you a facility that allows it to export to any of those, uh, you know, platforms that you have in your hand, which is just beautiful, which means you only do the job, the, that you only do the job once, and you let the machine, or in this case, the engine does the, uh, you let the engine basically do the rest uh, by just exporting it to different uh, platforms and you know, just choosing the specifics. However, it's now way easier to develop for multi-platform uh, uh, consoles, unlike before, where you used to have, so I'll give you a good example. Now, imagine you, back in the day where you wanted to do a game on the PS2, which is uh, maybe 10 year, uh, 20 years back, or yeah, 20 years, give or take. So supporting the PS2 alongside, uh, let's say, the Xbox, the original Xbox, meant that the developers had to go and actually develop the source code twice, one for each platform, because each platform has its own processor, its own operating system, uh, library. So it was a nightmare to support multiple platforms. This is why only big studios used to afford the, you know, the ability to go in and support multiple platforms to make money. However, now an indie game developer, uh, de developer like uh, myself or even you, you guys, can have the chance to develop a game once and just release it on most platforms, maybe with minor modifications for the controls and such. But again, this is uh, just beautiful. Okay, so all in all, now I just gave you a tour on why game engines are very important to the whole thing and why you, as a developer, would want to go and have a lot of attention, you know, and a lot of, uh, let's say, effort trying to, you know, really do your due diligence when it comes to choosing the right game engine. It's a lot of work because eventually it's going to be the ultimate ceiling for your, you know, creative vision. And so just remember, a game engine is basically the whole machinery that powers your game engine, or your game, sorry, in this case. Okay, just to summarize, game engines do the low-level difficult work on your behalf. Now, this is really important because I'll give you uh, an example that a, a lot of people don't really understand or appreciate. The PS3 used to have uh, a 256 megabytes uh, worth of frame, which is super little now, <laughs> super small, uh, you know, as of today. But back in those days, back in 2006, it used to be that you know, game engines. Um, uh, sorry, game, the consoles, um, you know, game consoles had to operate with a, a limited resources because it makes them very cost effective when people want to, you know, uh, uh, buy them basically from the console company. And so, you know, compromising on the memory, compromising on the CPU, the processor and the power and all of these things makes it very cost effective for players to acquire these game consoles. However, it makes it super difficult for game developers to work with. Because just think about it, if you're coming from that age, you know, or we, uh, from that era, the PS3 era, you would know that the PS3 used to have just amazing games, uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, uh, Heaven, uh, I forgot the name, what was it? 
Heavy Rain. You know, a lot of games out there, a lot of titles just, you know, just made uh, just made a lot of memories with us. And when you look at those titles today, you just say, "Wow!" I mean, how did they really pull it out? Uh, pull it off back in those days, where you have so uh, you know so little, little of that RAM and, and you know processors that are not really that strong when you compare them to what we have, you know, nowadays. And so it's all because the game engine itself takes care of doing a lot of shuffling, a lot of paperwork under the hood, without you know showing it to the player. And it's just basically amazing, you know, how the game engine is. is it's basically like your, uh, let me use that analogy. It's basically like your uh, mother in a way. It does all of the stuff for you and you just don't know about it and you get things done. Also, game engines define the scope for your game experience. We uh, reiterated on that multiple times. So your game really depends big time on the game engine that you use. Some game engines are really suitable for uh, FPS games, first person shooters. Some are really good when it comes to platformers. And so when you have a game, uh, let's say vision or a specific game design in mind, you want to make sure that the game engine is aligned with your vision. Otherwise, you know, it might be difficult to go and tweak the engine as you go. Game engines establish a standard pipeline to work uh, for work. And this is really crucial because if you currently deal with people like, uh, you know, programmers coming in from Unreal Engine 4, you know, any game developer working with, with uh, uh, the Unreal Engine 4, is going to be able to work on other titles out there, other games, if they are very familiar with the Unreal Engine, because they got used to the pipeline and the way you know assets are being sent from those uh, game tools. Uh, say in this case, the art uh, packages like Maya and Blender, all the way to the game engine. So establishing a pipeline is very crucial for developers to work on different titles. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck dealing with your specific game engine. It becomes very difficult for you to get acquainted. With other game engines out there so yeah really great engines out there again you have unity and unreal engine which are the most popular by far for a lot of reasons and we're going to talk about those reasons now and so when you really think about it when you want to choose a game engine you want to make sure you have an awesome community because you know think about the community as if it was your family eventually you're going to have problems with the code problems with the product you want to make sure that you come back and you ask, uh, ask those guys for help. So you want to make sure that the community is already help, uh, is helpful when it comes to you know doing this sort of thing. And you want to make sure that they exactly know what they're talking about. You know, I've seen a lot of engines that uh, had a lot of potential. However, the community was not really that big of a thing. And so, you know, when you have a problem, when you have things that you want to change, it becomes very difficult for you to get acquainted well with the engine because nobody really gives that much of a damn about your game at the end of the day and you're stuck on your, uh, you know, you're just basically on your own. Uh, a good example is Torque 3D. So I actually paid uh, a company uh, that used to have this game engine called Torque 3D and Torque 3D. Uh, the name of the company is uh, Garage Games, if I'm not mistaken. G Garage Games used to have those game engines out there, and they were one of the first, you know, people to put the game engine code out there for, uh, you know, for a specific amount that you can basically pay those guys. And so it was great, but the problem is it, whenever I had an issue with the game engine or actually dealing with my games, you know, nobody used to actually come back to me and help me with these things. And it's not, it was not only me. A lot of the people there used to suffer, and so it did not really pick up. Even though the game engine code was, you know, nice to work with, and there's a lot of stuff that you can learn, but the, the community was not there. Also, you need something that is good in terms of support. Game engines uh, might break often because of the complexity, and so you want to make sure that the game uh, engine developer is really fast and quick when it comes to releasing uh, bug fixes, uh, doing support on for the code base, and you know, for the features and the requests that you get. From the community so yeah just be aware of that you also have to make sure that the game engine that you want to choose has a decent portfolio um now unreal engine and unity really picked up because there's a lot of there's a lot of commercial games out there that were based on those two game engines so unreal engine had games like batman um uh, a lot of stuff basically most of the titles out there are based are on either unity or uh you know unreal engine so yeah, just many games. And also, you want to make sure that the engine that you work with is is uh, friendly. So you want to be up and running and really in no time. 
you don't want to spend a lot of time getting used to the engine and then you know you basically just do the work and it becomes difficult to add more developers and this is why a lot of shift has happened in terms of the philosophy of the game engines out there so as i said at the beginning uh unreal engine was never open in the first place if you ever witnessed uh, unreal engine 3 or even two, they were private source code bases. And so you had to be an affiliated developer with Epic Games in order to get you know, a copy of the source code and work with the game engine. However, now the philosophy is completely different. You have the code on GitHub. However, there's a twist to it. And as, I prob I'll, as I'll probably show you later on uh, down the line. But yeah, all in all, you have access to the source code as a developer. You can see what happens under the hood, how they implement those features up there. And it's not only that, it's just uh, the the bar is very low now. It's very easy for developers to get acquainted with Unreal Engine, unlike before. Unreal Engine uh, 3 used to use something called Unreal Script, which was very difficult. It was a, a prop tree language for Unreal, Unreal Engine. However, Unreal Engine 4 now uh, utilizes C++, which is a very popular uh, low level uh, in a way, low-level programming language, which make which makes it a great deal. You know, if you're coming from a programming perspective, uh, from a programming background, you can just get acquainted super fast with the engine. And even if you're not a developer, uh, a programmer, um, you can always just build your game logic using Blueprint, which is you know the graphics way of you know just hooking up nodes to each other to achieve the same basically logic. So yeah, yeah, there you have it. A lot of reasons for you guys to choose the right game engine. Okay. Now, the million dollar question is, why would you go and build your own game engine? Uh, meaning, I mean, if you've seen uh, the last couple of slides that I showed you guys, we have Unreal Engine, we have Unity, Game Maker, things that cater to 2D games, 3D games, and it becomes very crazy. Like, I mean, why would you go and create your own game engine if there's uh, if there are already a lot of you know great tools out there that can help you with your content and your vision to be realized? And so there are multiple reasons. But honestly, the, the most, you know, the, the, the two biggest factors by far is that some games require um, different game requirements and they're not available out there in the market. Now, this, not, this was not the case. Uh, so th this specific line in here was spun on back in the day because game engines were not really that popular. Each game studio used to have their own code bases, you know, uh, working on their own tools and such. And their game engine code was not built in a way that to, to accommodate multiple games going further, which means, you know, every time you develop a game, you have to go and pick up pieces from that game and then, you know, work on another game using those, uh, you know, pieces that you picked up. However, as people develop more games, more and more games, they figured out that, hey, you know what, we can create this generic sort of tool set that allows us to go and create games uh, faster in a uh, in a much more reliable way in a standardized pipeline for people to go and create uh, you know content um, and such and so historically a lot of game developers out there specifically uh, naughty dog created their own game engines trying to do their own custom requirements and you know one thing to note you know unreal engine and, and unity have really matured you know with time back but if you really think about it you know as a console developer you know dealing with dealing with studios like naughty dog uh, did put a lot of pressure on those developers to create you know state-of-the-art features like in cinema and cinema uh, uh runtime cinematics or what we call in-game cinematics meaning you know that sort of a thing that happens as you play the game all of a sudden the game shifts to a sort of cutscene, and then all of a sudden you get back to the play and you play without those loading screens happening in between well, that sort of a feature is called in-game uh, cinematics. And it's very, uh, it used to be a very difficult deal. This is why back in the day, you used to have games that abruptly just shut down, you know, uh, the scene and give you a video of some sort. And then that video is done and you go back to the game, you know, to play the game. But in a way that used to really, really hurt the immersion of the game. And so with in-game cinematics, you can just feel it as a fluid experience and you're on, I mean, you're on the game you know, with no abru uh, abrupt, uh, basically, uh, you know, stop just stopping you from, you know, having this sort of uh, momentum on the game. So yeah, different game uh, games requirements, uh, game requirements uh, really dictates what you use in terms of technology and why you want to build your own stuff. Internal quick support. So if you're dealing with a console game 
that has to be released, for example, on Christmas. You know, you're under tremendous pressure to get that game on time. And so you can't just afford in, you know, basically just wait for the game developer that owns the source code to go and release a, you know, feature, a bug fix. You might not have that sort of uh, luxury. And so with game engines that are mostly targeting uh, console support, like the PS2 and the PS3 back in those times, you know, it was really important that the developer, uh, the game engine development team, uh, it, it, was, it was very important to have them in-house within the company itself. So when something goes wrong with the tools, if they break down, you can always just come back to those guys and tell them, can you guys fix it? Yeah. So there you have it. Multiple reasons for people to go and really consider game engines, uh, game in-house game engine development. Okay, cool. So is game pro so is uh, engine programming a job? Definitely is. Uh, I'm gonna show you what people do here. Basically, if you're a game, if you are an engine programmer, you are most likely are going to go and you know put more features in the game engine to support different features needed by your game development team, the people who are you know basically putting the actual game content. Uh, so you might support, let's say. Collisions, you might support, as we said, in-game cinematics that allows you to get that sort of immersion in the game. Uh, AI support, sound, you know, uh, that sort of 3D sound support. Um, graphics, as we said, physics, um, even VR, for example, or, you know, those AR stuff happening in there. All of these things need somebody that can go, you know, and put the actual logic to support those devices and those experiences out there. So, yeah, there you have it. More features require an engine developer to go and add those features. And also, the most important thing by far in commercial games now uh, is the support to maintain platforms that are new and out there. So if you have a new console, let's say the PS5, which is coming up really, really soon, you would want somebody to just take care of the specifics of the PS5 and support it by your favorite engine. You as a programmer, if you, let's say you're a game developer, a generic game developer focusing on the experience itself, on the game itself, you don't have any experience developing uh, in low level uh, engine sort of support. You don't want to get into this sort of headache of managing the specifics of the PS5, the hardware and the libraries and every single thing. You just want to have the sort of abstraction. You focusing on the game, a game uh, vendor is, uh, you know, something, somebody like Epic Games or Unity Technologies focusing on the exact technology to, for you to realize that vision. And there, you, I mean, there you go. And so, by default, out of the box, you get to have more support for different platforms. And this is really beautiful. I mean, just think about it. You develop a game for unit for Android with a click of a button. You can also ship to, uh, not ship, basically build for, you know, the iOS, which is, I mean, it was, not, it was never the case before. So there you have it. Okay. So before I chart into the code and show you some of the stuff in, you know, in, I just want to show you the specifics of each layer of the game engine. A bit of theoretical stuff, uh, you know, a few theoretical stuff before we show, uh, you know, the code base here in the last probably 15 or 20 minutes. So there's a lot of math within uh, game engines, uh, physics and software stuff. And so when you have an engine game developer, most of the time you want them to conquer those specific disciplines. You want somebody who's really good with linear algebra, uh, somebody who is really good when it comes to understanding how physics work and the software aspects are the most important by far, in my honest opinion, because in the end of the day, you're dealing with a huge code base and, and uh, there are different elements that eventually have to talk, you know, with each other in a nice fashion. And so you need somebody who can really, somebody who knows the way around software to get those things to be glued in the right fashion. Yeah. Okay, so every time you look at those geeks, you know, just remember that these guys are the ones who allow, who are allowing you to realize your uh, game, uh, you know, experience and the creative direction that you have. So yeah, a salute for those guys, the geeks out there who are taking care of our <laughs> technology. All right, so if you are interested in money, let me just tell you that even game uh, engine programmers make a lot of money. You know, when you see them in the spectrum of software development, they almost make 150K a year in the US, which is a lot of money if you are working in the software industry. Normally people get around 60 to 100K, uh, 
you know, 64 juniors or probably 40K. But if you're a senior engine programmer, you can probably get 150K, which is a lot of money for a software developer in the US. So there you got it for the people out there who are interested in the cash. Okay, let's dig a bit uh, deeper here and see the exact elements where we're going to be see them. We're going to be seeing them in action in the actual code here. Okay, now what makes up an engine? How does it work? Can you just show me the exact layers in there? Cool. So this is what I call the engine lasagna. You have multiple elements, you know, within the game engine, and each sing, uh, each specific layer takes care of multiple, let's say, responsibilities or duties within the game engine. The first one is going from uh, bottom to top is the utilities and low-level subsystems. Normally, there is a specific layer in each game engine that takes care of very low-level items of the experience, of the game uh, experience. A good example is dealing with math. Math, memory, networking, user input, be it from the controllers, from the mouse, from the keyboard, libraries handling. So all of these things, sorry, might not be game specific. However, they're very crucial to having the best experience possible. And so something that I really adore is dealing with memory. So memory is a very important aspect if you're, develop, if you're developing a game. Most of the time, you want to make sure that your assets can really fit within the memory or the RAM of the ultimate game console that you're trying to support. So a good example, so to appreciate that sort of thing, if you ever downloaded uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 or just bought the copy, uh, the, the disc copy, you would know that, if I'm not mistaken, it was on a Blu-ray disc. And so it probably... Uh, it was probably 40 gigs, uh, 30 gigs, uh, give or take, so 39 or 40 gigs worth of data, which is a lot of data. However, when you have a lot of assets, how can you really give the, the, the most amazing experience to those players where you have a lot of content that you have to shove in the game and runtime? And so when a game engine uh, does a pretty jo a good job, you know, uh, handling memory, shifting assets back and forth. This is what we basically call resource uh, management. You know, you get that sort of seamless experience without exactly knowing the limitation of the machine that you have. So there you have it, utilities and low-level subsystems that might not be visible to the player, but eventually, you know, a game engine really relies on heavily to get the job done. When we move up uh, by a single step, we have game-specific subsystems, meaning the stuff that are happening within the, within the game itself and uh, a good distinction in here is when you deal when you talk about utilities and low-level subsystems, it doesn't mean that you always have to use that sort of so, uh, source code base in a game. You can also you just use the, single, the first layer in doing, let's say, a VR experience, in doing a 3D, uh, let's say, uh, interactive experience. So there's a lot to it. There's a lot of stuff we can rely uh, on, or let's say, leverage from, uh, and this specific layer and use it in other source code bases that we're working on, which is really beautiful. So I'll show you a engine called Banshee 3D. Uh, and there's a lot of code base, uh, you know, samples that you can basically pick up and put in your, you know, systems if you are interested in doing different things, even if you're not working on a game, which is just beautiful. And so when we move up the ladder and we go to uh, layer number two, you have game specific subsystem, uh, subsystem which mean uh, which means in this case, we are talking about systems that have a lot of impact on the game experience. A good example is dealing with animation or the render itself that takes those 3D assets and renders them on the screen in the best way possible and the fast, fastest way possible. Resource management is exactly what we talked about earlier. However, it is built on top of the ma memory management uh, you know, layer. And so you've got physics as well, the actual code base that deals with physics and simulation. And then when you go one step further up the, up the ladder, you reach the game editor component. Now, this game editor is not going to be in the finished game. So when you ship your game, you basically ship the game with the first two layers that you see here. The utilities, because eventually your game, your game is going to run on the... Uh, you know, the, on the final target on the, the, the platform that you're supporting, be it the PS4 or the PS3. And the game-specific subsystems, the actual logic, the code logic that gives you that sort of behavior, the animation, the render, they're also very important to the experience. However, the game editor is only needed when you are developing the game experience. It is not needed when you are running the game. This is why when you have game engines, they come with editors. So you can develop your game on your machine, be it a, be it a Windows machine or a Mac, you know, you finish your game, you're happy with the debugging, you're happy with how the experience is showing up. 
you test and you test and you test and you test. And again, remember to test, test, test. And by the end of it, when you publish the game for a target platform, when you ship the game, you don't ship the editor with the game. Now, there are a lot of cases where you want to show you ship the editor. Maybe you want to give the chance for the gamers themselves or your players to go and create more content for the game. But in most cases, you only ship the utilities uh, layer and the game specific layer. And you just remove that game editor all, all together and just make the game very compact You know, with those systems along with the content itself, be it the sound, the art, the animations, and every single thing. Yeah, so let's just dig into every single one of those items before we wrap up with the code. Okay, so when we're talking about the lowest level, you have so many elements. So I'm just gonna chart those really, really fast and I'm gonna show you how the, these things are really important for the experience. So nobody can give up math. If you hate math, it might be very difficult for you to join the engine force, <laughs> the game engine programming team, because there's a lot of stuff happening within your game uh, games that really require a good understanding of math. Linear algebra, vectors, if any of you guys remember vectors from university, uh, matrices, there's a lot of math happening under the hood, especially for graphics and uh, other stuff. But yeah, for the most part, graphics. Libraries management is a, also a, a very important deal. Normally when you have a game, you will also deal with different functionalities out there, things that we call libraries. A good example is when you have a game on your machine, on your PC, you have Steam. Now, Steam has a sort of integration that happens with the engine itself. So uh, the, the lobby for the players, the scoreboard, your friends that are playing in there, connecting them, matchmaking, all of these things might not be supported by the game engine. And so you will need that sort of code integration with things uh, like Steam. And so your game engine has to have that sort of capability to go and work with those uh, you know, dynamic uh, basically binaries out there. Things like DLL files or shared object files if it's coming from a Linux background. But eventually, you know, you have components that are shipped by different people that you need to onboard within your game in the runtime so you can you know, benefit from those functionalities. Input and serialization. Now, serialization is a pretty big deal. Not a lot of people acknowledge how this works. Normally when you work uh, with a game, you have objects on the screen, right? You have a player, you have, let's say, a wall or something. And, and, and these things have multiple characteristics, like uh, the location in terms of, you know, the, the Cartesian 3D uh, uh, coordinate system. And all of these items on screen have different characteristics and attributes. And so in order to play, let's say, a network game and replicate the experience somewhere else, far in the globe, you know, and the other side of the world, you want to make sure that you take all of these characteristics and squeeze them in a, what we call a serialized format, a very compact binary format that, that we then ship over the network, and then it gets extracted on the other side of the world and rendered on the screen. So there you have it. One of the most important things in network gaming's, uh, network gaming and, or even in, in saving a game. So a good example is when you save a game, what happens under the hood actually is, all of these characteristics of the game get saved in, in a binary format most of the time to, you know, to not allow people to tamper with the state of the game. For example, giving yourself more health or more abilities. And then that file can be loaded at a later time when the game loads, and then you can have the same state exactly where you left it. So one way for this to happen is uh, like when you have a hibernate or let's say a sleep function in your PC. It basically just takes, not a sleep, sorry, hibernate. Yeah. So in hibernate and Windows, for the sake of example, you take the full content of the memory and you save it in a binary format. You save it on the file system. And then by the time you load the your operating system, just loads that file and places in the memory. And there you go. You, you exactly uh, come back to the exact point where you left the machine. Memory management, as we said, a lot to it when it comes to managing memory. Uh, uh, a good example that I want to shed some light on is, you know, modern games don't have loading screens for the most part. Yeah, some of them might have those, but for the most part, as you go in a game, your game loads more assets, you know, uh, as you actually go. This is why you see, you know, the HDD or the SSD uh, LED really blinks a lot because it loads the content and the game engine just loads the content and it streams it on your screen without you knowing, without even doing it. Uh, so. One of the cool tricks that game developers uh, 
use when they're, when they're doing their games is that when they, for example, put you in an elevator trying to go from one level to another, most of the time it gives you that feeling that, hey, I'm in an elevator, I'm moving to another uh, stage or an, another level, but it's actually a trick where game developers try to load more content. And that was the end of the case before because the streaming technology was not at its best. However, nowadays, if you play a game like Uncharted, Horizon Zero Dawn, you have huge, massive worlds and you never stop to load those things, you know, and you move in. The game engine really predicts that, hey, you're moving there and it loads more stuff. Network handling also is a pretty big deal. How to send packets, how to avoid lag. Again, there's a lot of code that really realizes all of these things that you see in here. And we're going to have a glimpse in a second. OK, um, so I'm, I might take more minutes. Probably not finish, I'm not going to finish around 8, maybe 8.10 uh, or 8.15. So you can stick around if you're interested. Uh, the second layer is game-specific subsystems. You have things like animations, physics, as we said, rendering, which is pretty crucial to the whole game engine experience. So a good programmer is going to write a good renderer, which allows uh, the game engine to pick up those 3D assets and put them in the game in the best way possible, maintaining uh, you know the graphics fidelity, but at the same time, also striking the performance uh, barrier also. A good thing to really witness in here is script execution. Now, if you remember, old games were very difficult to program because the actual game logic had to be baked within the game engine itself. So there was no separation between the game, the game engine code and the game code itself. So the functionality that allows the game to function used to be exactly you know, melted down in the same sort of spaghetti code that has the game specific stuff. So imagine your, your game has bosses. It has, uh, let's say, uh, just basically specific code to your game. Um, how to, uh, you know, basically just bosses and moving all the platforms, collisions, you know, fights and all of these things. Ha these things had to be exactly baked in, uh, baked in within the code base that also manages the memory and everything that we mentioned in here. So the separation was really horrible. It made it very difficult for people to maintain code and such. And so after a while, people created two different systems. The game engine has a very clean interface for people creating game code. This is why we have this sort of separation now in new, let's say, modern game studios. You have people working on the game engine itself, trying to modify it and add more features. And then you have the game developers themselves, uh, you know, the generic people working on the game logic, creating experiences, creating levels, creating you know those cool action stuff that, that happened to you while you're playing your game. But yeah, there's a clear you know, abstraction between those two levels. And most of the time, a game engine can fix you know, the engine add more features without really disturbing, uh, you know, uh, the, momen the momentum of those guys who are developing the games, uh, general programmers. Uh, resource management, as we said, you know, shuffling uh, items back and forth without you knowing is really a huge magic, and it's being done on, you know, a very low level here. Okay, last but not least, let's talk about the game editor, some of the stuff here. You have object placement tools. You know, as you can probably see in Unreal Engine, live reiterating is really important. Back in those days, when you develop a game, you have to run the game from the ground up to check your stuff, if it feels good, if it's amazing. But now you get this sort of live environment where you can run the game, test it out, run the game at the same level, test it out. If you're happy with the values, you go ahead and move to something else. And so even simulating on platforms, imagine you're developing on, the, on your Windows machine. You want to simulate developing for the iOS or for Android. You can also do that from the same development machine. You don't have to go and you know compile the game, ship it and put it on the machine and try it out. And then if it doesn't work, you have to go and do more changes. And so this is a very a seamless experience now. Even pe the people who are developing for consoles, things like the PS4, the PS5, have a developing kit on the side, which connects to your Windows machine. And Visual Studio are one of those elegant tools connect to the machine, and it only uses that machine to actually deploy the, uh, the code and the binaries and run it on your screen. So there's a lot to it, you know, and that sort of integration between the IDE, the game development uh, engine, like Unreal Engine or so, and the integration with those new hardware devices coming up is just beautiful. You know, it spares a lot of headache. Also, publishing for multiple platforms, uh, export to different formats, plugin integration. So new things coming up. A good example is Unity. Now, Unity is heavily based on 
plugins. So a lot of people have plugins that were developed either by in-house or you know by different uh, vendors. And so at the end of the day, you want your game editor to be modified in a way to add those you know features so you can develop your game faster or even add more things. I remember back in our game, Dead Gear, we can, which you can probably find online, just write deadgeargame.com, uh, where me and my friend uh, Alex work on this game for some time. And by the way, it's due for publishing next year, finally, you know, after seven years. <laughs> uh, that 2D game, heavily, uh, we, we created a lot of, let's say, internal tool set to speed up, uh, you know, the development for our game. And so things that change the menus on Unity, change the inspector menu on the right side, you know, to add just more momentum for developers. So that was really beautiful. Okay, so when we're talking about choosing a game engine, just remember your game engine really decides how you can tackle development uh, problems. Things like, you know, open source, uh, sorry, uh, massive worlds, um, streaming, if you require that in, in a game, like level streaming, so no loading screens whatsoever, or open world games, um, 3D sounds, AI, all of these things really require that you have the right engine for the right job. Okay, um, let's see what we have here. Let's just see the difference between those two game engines before we look into the code. And I know I'm promising <laughs> to go to the code soon, but just bear with me. There's a lot that I want to share before we get to the code. Now, there, there are differences between game engines. Uh, so I have a comparison here between Unity and Unreal. Now, Unity is C-sharp based, which means it uh, it uses all, basically the same machinery that powers up the .NET environment. If you are a .NET developer on Windows, it uses the same .NET environment. However, it is not use, it's not using the .NET uh, framework shipped for Windows. It is using something that we call Mono, which works on Linux, on Windows, or even Mac. Yeah. So Unity is C sharp based, which means when you develop, which means if you develop your game and you ship it, you basically have something that is similar to C sharp binaries, but they don't work out of the box. They work internally within the engine when you're on the game. Also. We have features like GameObject.Find. If you're a scripter, if you script uh, games within Unity, you know that GameObject.Find is a very cool feature. You can just put the name of the object that you're looking for within the game code, and then you can find it and do things for it, uh, against it. You can move it. You can destroy it if you want. The problem with Unity, for myself at least, is that the code is unavailable. I mean, you're bound to work with the engine, but have all, ultimately no power over the source code. You can't do your own modification. You don't even know how it works on the inside. So yeah, I mean, good luck knowing how things work if you deal with Unity. And it's fair to say that it's easy to reverse engineer Unity's code. Uh, not the game engine itself, but the binaries done by the games. Uh, the, the binaries uh, shipped for, for the game, the games out there. Uh, and so there are a lot of games out there that were done on uh, through Unity. You can basically just use a tool like ILSpy to go and look into the actual code and see how it works on the inside. Now, this is really, um, it's a bad thing for developers because most of, the most of the time, a lot of people put a lot of effort creating the code base that is perfect for the game. However, it's very easy for people to have a look into the game and know how it works from, uh, from the inside. Unreal Engine, on the other hand, is C++ based, which means this feature called Hot Reload loads your code, but it's completely different in terms of implementation uh, when we compare it against Unity. Because you're using C++, there's a lot of linking with DLLs and such. And by the way, it's not very tolerant, which means there are uh, a lot of cases where it can break just the engine and you will see that the engine, the engine that just shut down for whatever reason. Also, even in terms of coding there, if you're writing scripts in C++, you always have to be super careful of what you're writing. A simple uh, mistake in your code in your script can really break the whole engine. Your whole engine has to be restarted, which is very annoying, by the way. And this doesn't happen with Unity because of the technology, because of the tech stack and how it's different. You see, with Unity, the game engine itself was built in C++, but the scripting engine where you put the actual logic of the game is done in C Sharp. And so when you break that C Sharp level, in this case, the mono runtime, as we call it, that mono engine is going to break and it can be loaded again. However, the engine, the IDE itself, is gonna, it's not going to break. It's not going to go anyway. Yeah. But with C, you know, a simple mistake with a pointer can really, you know, make your day way harder. 
And last but not, not really last, source is also visible. So this was never the case with Unreal Engine 3 or 2, but now with Unreal Engine 4, the philosophy is completely different. The source code is out there. You can see how people implement those features, things like VR, AR, even AI, uh, performance code that targets uh, uh, things like, you know, certain things on the iOS uh, platform or even an Android, all of these bits, the specifics of the implementation, you can now see them. It's just beautiful. As a programmer, I can always vouch, you know, the thing that really made me to do the switch from Unity to Unreal Engine was the fact that I, that source code was available now and I can have this sort of, you know, under the hood look and see how things work on the inside. Also, it's very hard to reverse engineer Unreal code because eventually it's C++, which is very difficult to, to really reverse engineering. If you are interested in understanding how reverse engineering works, you might want to check out one of my talks on Google Mina on YouTube. Just write Amina Taja reverse engineering, and you're going to find uh, probably an hour talk showing you how to exactly do reverse engineering or how a, you know, a software <laughs> reverse engineer is going to go and try to break into your code. OK, so what I'm going to show you today is the source code of a game engine called uh, Banshee 3D. Now, Banshee 3D was specifically chosen by myself because the implementation is very relevant to Unity. It has the same design elements. It has a C-sharp script, scripting system. So if you never had the chance to look under the hood you know, of Unity, Banshee 3D does exactly the same thing, and it has a very good design. Uh, so it has a layered sort of uh, design exactly what I showed you guys in here. You have the utilities, the low-level elements, and then you have another layer handling game-specific code, and then the editor itself, which makes it great for yourself if you're trying to build trying to build a product that doesn't necessarily require to have the world editor when you ship the game or ship even a different product that has nothing to do with games, but you can always you know, just leverage specific layers in your own uh, you know, design. It is open source, however, now, by doing this talk this time, this time around, it is just uh, so sad to say that it was taken from GitHub because the guy who was working on the source code uh, on the project for many, many years apparently had a lawsuit of some sort. So we're just going to keep it at that. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, forks online, a lot of clones, uh, cloned repositories for the, uh, you know, the repository before it got shut down there. So you can look into the code and see how it works. So I have the code here. I'll show you where to get it from GitHub. And by the way, it has a, an amazing and a decent documentation. So there's a lot to it. Even if you don't understand how uh, game engines work all in all, from a theor uh, theoretical uh, background, you can always go, just go, go uh, to the code and read those elements and try and understand as you go. Pretty beautiful, if you ask me. OK. Whew, finally, we are here. OK. Just give me a second. All right. First things first, bit of paperwork here. So this is the page of this Banshee 3D engine. It used to be Banshee 3D. Now it completely transformed it to what they call BSF or Banshee uh, framework, which essentially is not the full-fledged engine anymore. It is just those specific components that allow you to create you know, uh, your game experience. So it's like multiple libraries that can be used within your game engine. So imagine you're interested in having a subsystem that uh, can help you with memory management, streaming, uh, load the uh, level streaming. You can also get that library here and embed it within your source code base. So there you have it. Here's uh, the GitHub repository. There's a lot to it on how to compile it, how to see the examples. And you can probably get the same thing just like with Unity 3D. And if we look into those, yeah, into this image, it has a close, a very close look to uh, you know what Unity has. It has a hierarchy here, or the scene graph, uh, a resource sort of content browser in a way. Um, we have the properties on the inspector on the right side, and the scene itself where you can place objects. Yeah. Okay. So what I have done, what I have done here is that I downloaded the code of Banshee 3D or BSF in this case, and it's right out of the box. When you download it, it comes in a format that cannot be opened directly in, uh, uh, in Visual Studio. And that is for a specific purpose. You see, when you have Visual Studio, 
this means that you are operating on Windows. However, this guy, whoever created that big source code, was really smart because you know he figured out that you know what maybe people want to use my source code base on other platforms maybe Linux maybe Mac it really doesn't matter for that guy. However, what he went with he went with a system that we call CMake. Now CMake is a very popular product. Um, what it does is that you know it allows you to basically choose the source code base that you have, all right, and then you choose a target place where you wanna you know build the code, but now it can it, it asks you exactly do you want to have the code ready for a windows development environment do you want to run it on visual studio do you, you want to run it on xcode for the sake of example and i'll show you exactly how to do it here uh, but yeah i just did it before i did this session and it works like that when you basically choose the you know the download and get repo here that i have and i choose another uh folder for it to create the source code uh, project. When I click on configure, just look at that. It's it's gonna ask me what exactly uh, you want to have as a development environment. You want to have this as a as a Visual Studio project. You want to have this as InMake for Linux. You want to have that as code blocks for people working with uh, Windows uh, tools, open source tools. You have Sublime on Linux, if I'm not mistaken, Eclipse. So yeah, a lot of tools, and you can even add different things if you want Xcode and such. It's just wonderful. The second you do finish, you have your project that works specifically for that development environment. And again, this is beautiful. Why? Because you are no longer bound to a specific platform. You don't like Windows? Fine. Nobody's having an issue here with that. You can always have the code and let it work on Linux if you want. So I took the liberty to actually do this in here. And by the time you configure it, there's a lot of work that is being done by CMake to configure the project for you. And it tells you exactly what you want to put in the source code. Do you want to have support for Banshee uh, plugin and a lot of technical details that you can find on the documentation page. But however, what I'm trying to show here is that the CMake process makes it very flexible for you to choose the kind of elements that you want to put in your project. You don't necessarily, you don't need to have the full source code loaded into your development environment. You can specifically choose. A good example is imagine for the physics, I want to go with physics by NVIDIA which is the physics engine by NVIDIA. Imagine that I don't want to have physics support in my source code. I can just click on null. Or for graphics, I want to rely on DirectX 11 for the sake of example. I don't want to do this over OpenGL or, or I want to use Vulkan, which is new. And so the second you choose all of these settings and you click on generate, your project gets generated and you can then work with it in your favorite uh, IDE. So I just created those. Uh, I just chose all of these settings and I chose uh, Visual Studio, and there you have it. I have the full Visual Studio project in here. It's not actually a project, it's a solution. And complicated projects have that sort of trend. So Banshee 3 d is a solution that has so many stuff in it. It has a FBX loader, which can you know, help, uh, loading, uh, help in loading FBX content from Blender, from a 3ds Max. GL, the, the render itself, and OpenGL, if you are interested in knowing how 3D programming happens. The Mono Engine itself, exactly what happens in Unity is here, so you can examine how this is implemented. Uh, the game editor, uh, see the editor script. So things like how the Unity editor was built, you can see the exact you know implementation here. It's super cool. So just before we wrap up, I'm just going to take one layer in here, one source uh, project and show you how it's uh, implemented. So eventually when you create a project, uh, sorry, when you create a solution, there is a sort of dependency among the solution, uh, the projects. So you, you, you can easily see that, uh, for example, this solution, Banshee 3D, uh, sorry, this project, Banshee 3D, uh, has dependencies on other stuff that you can probably see, see, probably see here on the code. So I just want to show you dependencies for the sake of, uh, you know, having clarity here. There you have it. So Banshee 3D, this, the project depends on all of these libraries generated. The other stuff, let's take, for example, BSF Mono. Mono only leverages the BSF library here, and this is a very CMake-specific thing. But however, this shows you exactly in the source code you know, how projects connect with each other, you know? So how the engine itself feeds into other 
projects that are on top of uh, you know different layers. So let's just go over the very you know uh, low level layer that I showed in the very beginning. You remember in the lasagna you have three layers, the very low level, and you can probably see here under allocators different pieces. I mean different snippets that have to do with memory management. Check this out. Um, memory, let's say, ba, 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 let's say group allocation here, group alloc. And um, let me just increase these, just make it a bit bigger so you can, you know, have more clarity on the code. So yeah, when you see it in here, you can probably see that there's code that is C++ oriented. Of course, you might not know how to deal with C++. However, it's just beautiful how it's being done. And all of these things in here uh, capitalize on modern C++, C++ 17 and the one coming up really, really soon. So how to exactly allocate the memory, how to allocate it when you don't need it. And sophisticated game engines like those, like Banshee and Unity-like engines, have a lot of choices when it comes to allocating memory. You might want to allocate the memory per frame, you know, for the game, you want to allocate it and then deallocate it by the end of the game. Other sophisticated means for either doing memory management is allocating every single thing. Okay, so here's one trigger for you guys. Because allocating, allocating memory is normally a very heavy um, functionality to be done in the runtime while you are running your game. What most game engines do is that they help you by allocating a huge amount of memory in the beginning of the game. And so when you are trying to allocate the game engine itself, that manages the memory, not the operating system. There's a lot of difference in that. If you imagine you're developing a game and then you don't re really uh, you know, depend on a game engine like that, and you try to allocate more memory in the runtime, you'll find that your game really chugs. It stops every now and then because the operating system has to stop the game thread you know, get more memory and then allow your program to run. This is called uh, context switching, basically, or preemptive uh, running. And so with game engines, you know, it does that sort of sophistication where it allocates the full memory for you and then it gets you, you know, to basically ask for memory from the game engine itself, which is instantaneously. You don't have to go to the operating system. Yeah. So, yeah, there you got it. It's just amazing for the memory. We have stuff on animation. If you want to see how the animation is loaded, how the frames are being set up, um, let me show you something very cool. So even strings, by the way. So even the way you handle strings, even the way you send messages on screen, all of the source code here really takes care of that. And it's beautiful because it's all based on C++. There's a lot to it. And remember, this was done in a way that this was done in a way that makes uh, Banshee Engine very, let's say, modular, meaning I can just take that BSF file uh, project and use it on my own project without really taking the full editor and everything else in the code base. But yeah, so you have things on the editor. Let's see this side of the code here. So this is the OpenGL renderer. And remember, I chose OpenGL when I did generate the project. But if you do it over DirectX, you're going to find more things coming up in here, the exact source code for DirectX. And so here's the source code that takes care of rendering stuff. So eventually, your assets are going to come in terms of triangles, vertices, and they have to be you know, uh, automatically maintained by the engine. The engine got to make sure that every asset is in memory when you want to display them. It takes them out, uh, away from the memory when something goes wrong or you go into another level. And all of that source code is actually maintained in here. So very complicated stuff like GPU buffers, for example. And that is a good example on how to reserve memory on the graphics chip. So the, the, the exact source code is here. And uh, I know there's a lot to it, but I just want to show you that the low level here takes care of a lot of stuff. Sound, how sound operates, uh, allocators, which is the most favorite thing by far for myself. Uh, math. Okay, let's just finish with math before we close up the session. So linear algebra, as we said, is implemented in here. So when you go to VS Math here, Meshi Math CPP, everything from you know those uh, basically the the functions uh, that you find in math uh, and try uh, yeah basic uh, basic stuff here. Let's see cosine cosine uh, dot products. Uh, 
So yeah, there's a lot to it. And if you can actually see how matrices are implemented in here, you can exactly see how they are being done in terms of memory, how the classes are, are laid out. So yeah, there's a lot to it. You know, I took almost seven days to read the full source code and I don't think I'm gonna do justice for it now. However, yeah, uh, I just wanted to show you how beautiful it is and how accessible it is for you guys to look on how Unity-like engines are implemented. So yeah, there you go. By the way, you can find the source code in here, GitHub, Game Foundry slash BSF, and you can see the full thing. And there's also more, multiple uh, copies of the uh, deleted branch, uh, deleted repository. Just write Banshee 3 d uh, clone or repository in Google. Okay, so just moving on. Final thoughts before I go away. Um, game engines define your gaming experience. Always remember that you are limited to what your game engine can provide. Good game engine programmers are very hard to find because there's a diverse set of skills that you have to master if you want to develop, you know, game engine code, and they're product they're pretty much full paid. Um, a lot is happening inside a game engine, as you probably saw, and the source code does a better storytelling, you know, uh, that sort of thing. You will we will never be able to conquer it within you know uh, an hour or so. Um, low level tasks like memory management, input, physics, it's all be handled by the engine, and uh, even the stuff that you find on the screen, uh, like from graphics fidelity. Uh, if you're interested in reading more, finding more information. I highly recommend, I can't just recommend this enough, Jason Gregory's book. Now, Jason Gregory, in case you did not know, is the lead programmer, lead engine programmer in Naughty Dog. He has a wealth of information on how to lay out the design of the game engine, uh, specific layers, how to do it from a performance point of view, how to do it in an easy software-oriented uh, point of view, how to you know make this to make the layers work, uh, work with each other nicely, the book is called Game Engine Architecture. It has now the third edition out there. Very beautiful book. There's a lot of stories from Naughty Dog themselves. They put pieces of code of their game engine, uh, how it really played out within their games, like in Uncharted, in Last of Us. And the second book is Mike McSheffrey's Game Coding Complete, a wonderful book that shows you how to, you know, uh, you know, take care of those uh, important things in the low-level design. And also Banshee 3D is amazing. I'm not sure if the website is still up and running. However, clones are there on GitHub and you can check them out. A well-designed engine, I can't stress enough on that. You can learn so much in terms of C++, how to uh, maintain memory, how to do optimized code, how to do it in a way that is very modular. You don't wanna work on games. It's very easy to just pick up the last layer and work on other stuff. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Woo! That was a, like a huge marathon. So I hope you really enjoyed the session. There was a lot into it. Um, you can always follow my work at aminatajer.com or on my handle here, uh, through my handle, at aminatajer. I put a lot of details on game development and artificial intelligence. If you're interested in our products that have to do with artificial intelligence, check out infiniteware.com. And also we have a product on game development that somehow is uh, mixed up with artificial intelligence. So that is very cool. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for having me in here. And thanks, you know, uh, the guys from uh, GDG Jidda. And now I can open up for questions. Awesome. It was an awesome session. I loved it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and we can see from the comments as well that uh, the audience loved it as well. Uh, thank you so much, I mean. Uh, so yes, uh, Q&A session time. All right, cool. So, yeah, we have one question. So this is the source okay. code. Yeah, go for it. Awesome. Yeah, so <laughs> the first question is, any reason to program your game without that engine? Um, if you have a very simple game to work with and you don't intend to continue working on other stuff in the future, you might just want to do it once. But to be quite honest, you're going to give yourself a lot of hard time. <laughs> it's going to be very difficult for you. It's going to give you, uh, because there's a lot of stuff that you have to manage, you know, those low level details. And, and sometimes you just want to work on the game itself. You don't want to care about how to handle those things. You you might as well just leave it to the people who are really proficient with that sort of that sort of thing and just focus on the game itself. But if any of you guys feel like they're very adventurous, they, they want to do that, 
go for that. Uh, one thing that I really recommend, if you are interested in knowing how games operate on the inside, is that to always create your own game engine, even if it's just primitive. Just go over the whole journey from creating a very simple game engine to appreciate what goes exactly under the hood. So yeah. Awesome. And the second question is, are are they uh, are there uh, any examples of games developed in Bahrain or GCC? Of course, of course, of course, of course. Uh, so we started the game development in uh, community back in Bahrain around 2012 when he came back from the States. Uh, it was called Bahrain Game Developers, or BGD for short. I actually uh, had to focus on the business more back in 2016. So we have a we have two sisters, uh, two sister communities, Unreal Engine, uh, sorry, Unreal Bahrain, uh, by my awesome friend Yusuf Bahazza, and we also have Unity Syndicate uh, by Manam and a couple of friends. And so those two uh, uh, communities uh, really spawned from you know the work that we've done in the beginning back in 2012. And there's a lot to it. When you join in their WhatsApp groups, you'll see a lot of the stuff. But I really urge you to check out Unreal Bahrain here on Google. Yeah, there you got it. So you can see workshops in here. You can see sample demos, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, also, some of the work that people have done back in the past. So yeah, just check it out. Check our work here on Bahrain. <laughs> awesome. Okay, we will wait for uh, one minute and uh, for basically for the questions, and then definitely we'll uh, wrap it up. Okay, let the timer start. <laughs> Less than one minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. We're doing awesome. Okay. Okay, so we have a question. Mm -hmm. Which says, is it difficult? Is it difficult to go through the process of uh, publishing uh, games? Um, well, that used to be the case a long time back, to be quite honest. So if you develop, if you wanted to develop a game for a console, uh, let's say you, want to develop, you wanted to develop a game for the PS3 or the PS2, um, you actually had to have a really great record, uh, track record in developing games. And for these people to give you the, the development kit, also known as the dev kit, because they were very scarce. And, uh, you know, you actually get access to the to the console platform owner, uh, you know, documentation. And basically there's a lot of confidentiality spanning the whole thing. So it was not an easy case. But going forward, the whole thing changed, honestly, even the philosophy of the way games are done. So you have indies working on games. You don't necessarily have to work in game development studios, huge game development studios to create your own games. You can just work on your game from your garage, from your own, you know, uh, house and then just release it. And there are a lot of success stories spanning that space. And so it became much easier. Now there is a very streamlined process to develop games you know, as NDs and just give it to people. With Steam now, it's just uh, an easier case uploading your game and asking, you know, uh, just putting it on the store it was never that case before. So much easier now, thanks to the tools out there and how the whole mentality just shifted in the last couple of years. Awesome, sounds great. Uh, another question is, uh, why aren't there more GCC uh, Bahraini games on Steam um, or PS uh, Store? Okay, so maybe a lot of people don't know exactly that, but there's a lot that goes into making a game. It's not an easy case. So, okay, maybe the engine is taken care of by big players like Unreal Engine and Unity. However, the content itself, there's just a lot of tears and efforts being uh, you know being shed <laughs> in making a game so 
normally uh, you have programmers creating the actual logic in the game, sound designers, graphics artists, um, people sketching the game, level designers, as we said, um, environment artists, um, even AI programmers. So depending on how big your game is and how complicated it is, you know, there's a lot to it. And so it might not be a job for a one man show. And, uh, and so this is why a lot of people take a lot of time. I honestly created, was working on a game with my friend Alex in the US for quite some time. And I was the only programmer. He was the only uh, game designer slash level designer, almost everything else. And we also have a sound designer with us. And so it was a collaborative effort, you know, working in our day jobs and just focusing on the game itself. Uh, but that takes a lot of time because you're not doing it a full time. And there's a lot of things that have to be accomplished at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, um, it's difficult, but we are gaining more and more track, uh, traction, to be quite honest. The government is also, you know, giving a lot of attention to the game development industry now and the scene in Bahrain. I'm super happy to where we've gotten now. Uh, you know, I remember starting in 2012 where I booked my first room in, in, uh, in Bahrain for game development. We only had maybe nine or eight people and they were all strangers. Nobody knows the other one. And now going forward, we have communities, we have uh, workshops happening all, uh, all the time. And we had a GCC game development conference back in 2000, uh, I believe 17 or, or 18, I actually forgot, where we had developers come from all over the GCC to showcase their work and to, to talk about their, the craft. So there you got it. We've gone, we've come a long way. Awesome. Uh, we have another question from, uh, one second. Yeah, so he's, uh, uh, we have this question. He's asking for the last link uh, for demos. Uh, yeah. I have shared it, uh, Abdurrahman, in the chat, but I will share it uh, one more time. Okay. <clears throat> I think he's talking about the, uh, Repository, right, uh, Abdurrahman? Yeah, yeah, the repository is there. GitHub slash game founder slash BSF. Or we can just show it in here. So there you got it. Just write BSF and you're going to find the first, you know, uh, yeah, BSF by Game Foundry. I think the also the website awesome. is down. Yeah. But yeah, the code base is here. You can really look it up. And the second you get it on your machine, there's just too much stuff to learn from. <laughs> So, yeah, awesome. Yep. Uh, I've shared the link, uh, Abdurrahman, in the chat. We have another question that says, uh, please uh, we're, shed we're some light up. on other... Uh -huh. uh, please uh, please uh, shed some light on other field uh, game engines that can be used for other mm -hmm. than making games. Uh -huh. Okay, so CryEngine, um, if any of you guys played the game uh, Crisis before, now also um, got their engine out, and I think it, it got bought by, uh, got acquired by Amazon, I think. So Amazon has their own game engine. But yeah, there's a lot of varieties, honestly. There's a lot of choices. Um, yeah, I mean, if you could just go and write game engine choices for the sake of example, let's see. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, just the first page in here shows you um, Unreal Engine is the biggest by far, you know, things like Gears of War, Mass Effect, Bioshock, you know, really cool titles out there that really define the experience that you get while when, when you develop a game uh, through that sort of engine. Unity, Game Maker is really cool for 2D games, by the way. Godot is pick, picking up really fast. And yeah, there's a lot of choices. Just look around, you know, just get acquainted, try them for some time. But eventually, if you want my honest opinion, either work with Unity or Unreal Engine, uh, because you also need that sort of support from the community, as we said. Otherwise, you're going to be working on a technology that is not supported by somebody else. It's going to make your life much more uh, difficult. Indeed, true, true. Uh, another question we have is, uh, have you noticed any trend in the type of games succeeding? What's the best bet? OK, so one thing that comes to my mind is that Unreal Engine is very popular for the graphics fidelity. Everyone knows that when you're dealing with graphics uh, with uh, Unreal Engine, you're granted to have this sort of out-of-the-box graphics fidelity. And so it's just beautiful. Uh, even if you are a lousy game designer, yeah, you just might want to go for Unreal Engine for the sake of having that sort of you know, graphics uh, you know, fidelity. And so 
yeah, Unreal Engine is very popular for that. Uh, Unity is very popular for having an awesome support for mobile phones. And so I remember doing a lot of commercial projects um, for clients. And it was very easy for me because I used to develop on the Windows, on the machine that I used to have. And it's just a matter of connecting it to the iOS through another machine, you know, that has uh, basically, uh, basically a Mac machine. And then just that clicking the button and having that exact executable going to my, uh, you know, device with no headache and nothing. Everything is being maintained by the engine. So yeah, my advice, if you're looking for fidelity, you have Unreal Engine, but there's a lot of things that you have to learn. And also by the way, remember, you're gonna use C++ for the scripting. You're not, you, you might not be a fan of C++ like myself, um, but you can always come back and use the blueprint sort of thing, which is, you know, uh, that sort of a graphical way of doing uh, game logic. Or in Unity, you can use C Sharp if you're much more familiar with .NET and you find it easier to work with uh, C Sharp code. And Unity is way easier to work with. But anyway, yeah. Awesome. OK, we have no more questions. So uh, <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Um, yeah. So I've sent now in the chats. One second. Let me send this. Yeah, so you can find, I mean, Al Tajir everywhere <laughs> on social media platforms, uh, as well as you can find uh, GDG Manama and GDG Jeddah on Twitter, uh, Meetup, Instagram. Uh, yes, that's it for now. <laughs> and uh, yeah. stay tuned for more awesome events. <laughs> and stay safe. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. And you guys have a good day. And again, thank you, GDG Jeddah, for having me. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.